Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be together, for the opportunity to hear uh, your word read and proclaimed. We just pray that you'd be at work in these moments. We pray that you'd be at work in these words that I speak, whether through me or in spite of me. We pray that your people might hear from you today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a feeling that the Pharisee in today's story would be perfectly comfortable in the modern world of social media. Because, honestly, if you think about it, his prayer is a lot more like a tweet or an Instagram post than anything else. Thank God I'm not like them. Hashtag bless, right? There are about 146 million posts on Instagram tagged hashtag blessed. There's another five that are hashtag blessed praying hands. There are about 100 different variations on hashtag blessed. Millions upon millions and millions of posts. I've sampled them. Not all of them, but I sampled some just to see what they were about. Some were pitching crypto. I don't know what that's about. A disproportionate number of them had something to do with either luxury cars, fancy vacations, or like real estate opportunities. Hashtag blessed. An inordinate number of them were about people's body parts. Hashtag blessed, right? Hashtag blessed is another way to say, hashtag look at me. Hashtag I'm better than you. That's what it means for so many people. It's a way to advertise. It's a way to draw people in. But it really has nothing to do with the notion of blessedness as we understand it. Now, it's easy for us to make fun of the Pharisees for their self-righteousness. And there's no doubt that the Gospels tend to lead us in that direction. But there are some things that we ought to consider before we totally buy into that perspective. That the Pharisees are entirely the problem. Do you remember a few weeks ago when we started this series, I was telling you a little bit about Luke's Gospel and when it dates from and some of those kinds of ideas. So most scholars think it was sometime between like 70 to 90 AD, around that time. So maybe like 40, 60 years after Jesus was on the earth. And most scholars would also agree that at that time, because the church was growing, there was this kind of growing conflict between church and synagogue. And so that when we read these passages about Jesus and his disagreements with the Pharisees, it's coming out of a place where there is all this heightened tension that may or may not exactly have been there during Jesus' life. I have no doubt that there were tensions with the Pharisees during Jesus' life, but the way the stories are told heighten that and accentuate it. But I also want to point out one thing that we often forget. So Jesus is, in fact, quoted as saying, and we get really hung up on the idea that the Pharisees were all about like the letter of the law. But Jesus himself says, I tell you, not a letter, not a stroke of the letter of the law will pass away until all things are fulfilled. So both the Pharisees and Jesus cared about the law. Now they came at it maybe in different ways, but they both were very much interested in the notion of what does God require me to do in my everyday life? How am I supposed to live? Because at that time, there were so many who relied on the notion of, well, I'm going to follow the ritual. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to offer my sacrifices. And, you know, that will be that. But the Pharisees were very much alongside Jesus interested in helping people to understand, no, 
what matters more than you going and offering a sacrifice is how you live day by day by day. What does your faith say about how you're living day by day? I find it interesting that unlike most parables, where Jesus kind of takes you on this journey, where Jesus really takes you by the hand and kind of leads you through this landscape of the story, I mean, think about the parable of the prodigal son. If you don't know it, when I describe a little bit of the plot, you probably will recognize it. So it's about the father who splits the inheritance, gives some to his younger son, his younger son goes and spends it, right? And it's all about his exploits and his challenges and his return home. If you think about that story, it just kind of sucks you in. It's the reason why we paint and tell stories about it over and over and over again. It's because this story captures our imagination and it breaks down our resistance. And that's what parables were meant to do. They were meant to break down our resistance. That's my understanding, at least, of how parables worked. So frequently, when you see Jesus telling a parable, it arises out of a time when people were coming at him, arguing with him about something. And instead of arguing back, what he would say is, let me tell you a story. Have you ever done that? Employed that strategy to kind of break down resistance? Jesus was a master at it. And that's what these parables do. So when you're reading parables, part of the way that you understand what they mean is you look at, okay, who is Jesus talking to? What are the attitudes that they might have that he's trying to break down? How am I guilty of having that same kind of attitude? These are the kinds of questions that we want to ask when we're reading a parable. Because some of them are hard to understand, but it helps when we look at who is Jesus talking to, what's happening before, what's happening after, and what is it that Jesus is trying to break down here? But this parable, very interestingly, is nothing like those more subtle stories. Jesus instead kind of comes out swinging. It's much more like satire than anything else. He's creating this caricature of a Pharisee. Oh, look at me. I pray twice a day. I fast twice a week. I give 10% of everything. I don't cheat. I don't steal. I don't rob. Unlike this guy over here. The whole thing is kind of a caricature. And so the way that we read this sometimes is that Jesus loves the scoundrel more than Jesus loves the righteous and holy person who does everything right. That's how we're tempted to read this. But I'm not sure that's exactly right. It is true that tax collectors were scoundrels. So first of all, tax collectors were hated because, just simply because of their wealth. You had to be wealthy to be a tax collector. Now notice what I said. You didn't become wealthy because you were a tax collector. You had to be wealthy before you could become a tax collector. Why is that? It's because Rome required the payment of taxes in advance. So... The way it worked was I would put in a bid to collect taxes for a certain area. And Rome said, okay, show me the money. You paid the money. That earned you the right to collect the taxes for a certain period of time. Now, it was your job to go out and make that money back. And then some. And whatever you made back extra was profit. Do you need to hire people to beat people up in order to get money? Okay, have at it. So you can see how Jesus, in associating with tax collectors and in creating these stories where the tax collectors are the heroes, is taking a huge risk. Tax collectors were hated because they were helping to fund the army that was occupying the land. Nobody liked them. 
So the point of the story can't be just be like the tax collector. That's not the point. And if that's the only point that we take away, that's not the right point. The tax collector knows that he's done something wrong. He's ashamed. He can't even look toward heaven. He does this, which is a traditional way of saying, I'm sorry for what I've done. It's a way of saying, I want God's word to come into my heart. It was something you would do during the prayers in the synagogue. And it was a sign that you were truly repentant. So yes, we want to be like the tax collector in that way. But in terms of how we live, we want to be like the Pharisee. That's the reality. The difference is that hashtag. That's the difference between the two. Be holy like the Pharisee. Be humble like the tax collector. That's the whole point here. Because we're never justified by the things that we do. We're never justified by the prayers that we pray, by the amount of money that we give, by our fasting. I mean, think about this. The Pharisee is giving thanks that he fasts twice a week. Do you know what, it, what, what kind of a luxury it was to be able to fast twice a week? That means that you're making the choice not to eat. What was Jesus' most famous prayer? Give us today our daily bread. And here's this guy celebrating the fact that I've got enough money that I can just decide not to eat a couple days. I'll make that sacrifice. So the point is, Yes, be holy like the Pharisee, but be humble like the tax collector. Because when you think that you are somebody, that's the moment when God will remind you that you are nobody. And just at that moment when you've convinced yourself that you are nobody, that's the moment in which God reaches out to remind you that you are somebody. Now, it's harder than it looks. It's harder than it looks to maintain the attitude of the tax collector. Because as soon as we have a little faith, as soon as we have a little understanding, it is human nature to look around and judge others. That's human nature. That's what it means to be humans in pursuit of God. Except... The reality is that we are not humans in pursuit of God. We are humans being pursued by God. And our role is to make sure that we don't get in the way of God's pursuit of the people around us. I have to believe that the fact that we allow those kind of pharisaic kind of tendencies within us to come out is one of the primary reasons why in 30 years we've gone from a place where 85% of Americans identified themselves as Christian, now it's 65% in 30 years. Why? Because we're getting in the way of God's pursuit of people. And we're getting in the way through the fact that we are always about hashtag blessed. You know, I started off this message talking about that. I still think it's ridiculous that you can use hashtag blessed to pitch crypto or Lamborghinis or whatever else. I think it's ridiculous. But it's also important for me to acknowledge that even as I say that, my message is not all that different from what the Pharisee is saying. Thank God I'm not like those people. And chances are you can go into any church, anywhere, on any given Sunday, and you're probably going to hear 
at least a little bit of that message that's, thank God, we're not like those people. It's a constant battle that we have with ourselves not to go down that road. And that's the nature of what it means to be imperfect humans in a relationship with a perfect God. And so this week, here's what I'm inviting you to do. This week, you will run into a situation where you know something that's happening is not right. And your thought will be, thank God I'm not like those people. What I want you to remember are the words of the tax collector. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks that despite the hypocrisy that lives in each one of us, despite the struggles that we have, to be humble before you, to allow you to work within us. We pray that we might again be renewed and encouraged and strengthened in our faith so that we might continually come before you with humility and openness to what it is that you have to teach us, how it is that you're leading us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.